impartation, the impartation. Let's begin to praise the Holy Ghost. Let's begin to praise the Holy Ghost. Who is this man? 
that he can go in and the sea obey him. The Lord says, one of the things about the kingdom of God is that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead resides in us. And because that same spirit resides in us, we get to operate it have delegated authority. We get a chance to demonstrate that and do the same thing Jesus did. In fact, the Bible says, Jesus said, greater works shall you do. And so, this is going to be, once you submit to the partnership of the Holy Spirit, this is going to be your same revelation. Yeah. And people are going to begin to ask you, who is this woman? Who is this man? That the winds and the waves obey him. Come on, let me throw your hands. I'm going to be the man where the wind and the waves obey him. Worship humbles you under a greater authority. 
Many of us, we like to esteem ourselves to be significant, and the spirit of entitlement comes with pride. Yeah. And so it makes us not want to bow to the Lord, but in worship, you are bowing under a higher authority. So this is one of the reasons why, not just because we pray because we want something from God. We don't just fast if we want God to do a miracle. Yes, that's part of it. But the main reason why we engage in spiritual weapons is because they keep us humble. And pride is what comes before destruction, the Bible says. And the Holy Spirit is what comes leads to a great fall. And so we want to be humble. Because the moment you get in pride, pride shifts you to rebellion. You rebel against all measures of authority. The highest authority is God. You begin to rebel against that authority, and then that begins to bleed over into every section of your life. From authorities on your job, authorities at the church, you begin to rebel against all authority. And if someone begins to think that you're not rebelling against authority, because you may not be rebelling against the apostle or the leader, but you rebel against the one that I place in position. It is still rebellion. And so once rebellion is generated, it will produce self-engineered storms. Storms that have nothing to do with God. So you cannot blame God for, God, why am I in this? God's like, I didn't place you in that storm. You made that decision out of rebellion. You decided to push away the safeguards of the voices that are placed in your life to keep you out of the bondage that you're in. You made that decision, so this is a self-engineered storm. And self-engineered storms are real, and the only way out of them is repentance. The only way out of them is submitting your life to a life of humility, because pride is what got you in the storm. Humility is what's going to get you out. We preached yesterday. And so self-engineered storms are real. Well, the Lord showed me that many of us were dealing with storms in this season. This house. Some of you are in a self-engineered storm. Some of you are in God-engineered storm. We'll get into that. Some of us may not be in a storm, but you're connected to someone who's in a storm. And oftentimes that plays such a great significance because whoever you're connected to that's in a storm, it affects you in some kind of way. And sometimes the enemy will attack people closest to you to get access to you yourself. One prophet released a word over me and my wife, and I'll never forget it. God, God knows he made sure it's faithful in my heart. He told me, he was pointing at me, but he looked at my heart, he said, whenever the enemy wants to get to you, he was talking to me, he says he will always work through your wife. So sometimes the attack that's happening to your spouse, the attack that's happening mm. to the close family, the attack that's happening to your children, the enemy works to the closest circles and degrees around you in the hopes and the attempts to affect you personally. Come on. This is why it's dangerous to be so self-consumed and self-absorbed to where that's their issue. That's their problem. That has nothing to do with me, but it actually has everything to do with you. And so self-engineered storms are real. I've seen people do this all the time, some financial storms they get in, and they go, God, what happened? And Come on. You know, God didn't tell you to blow your money. That's, that's your rebellion right. to that financial storm. Right. So some storms, you just got to lay it out. It's just not going to bypass. You can't just pray to some storms. You just can't say they're praying. You just have to just lay it out. I'm going to lay it out and let this storm bypass. And through humility, God will allow that storm to bypass. God engineers storms. This is through the sovereignty of God to where God permits or allows a storm to come into your life because God sees that the storm can produce a greater harvest of character, a greater harvest of endurance, patience. There's a level of maturity that only can be generated by going through a God engineered storm. God engineered storms are very different. So you've got to be careful because you can really easily mistaken or think that a God engineered storm can be another type of storm. And God engineered storms are very strategic when you go to God engineered storms. And what are your way out of God engineered storms? Endurance. You have to endure that storm. You cannot hold your hand, you cannot quit. 
You cannot complain. These are the ways that keeps you into the storm longer than you have to. Every storm has a timetable. Mm -hmm. The storm that the Israelites were in was an 11 day storm that turned to 40 years right. because of how they handled and managed the storm. You have to manage your storms well. Yeah. And God engineers storms. I'm not seeing this part about the count it all joy when you go through various traps. This is what we call God engineers storms. He says you count it all. The one of the ways to get out of a God engineered storm, you got to worship while you wait. You got to pray on joy. Satanic engineer storms won't be 
the other side. On the other side is healing. Yeah. On the other side is deliverance. Yeah. On the other side is peace. Yeah. On the other side is breaking the generational curse. Yeah. On the other side is your future marriage. Yeah. On the other side is your breakthrough. On the other side is everything that you can imagine. God has promised you for your life. Yeah. It's on the other side. The same says, I have a plan to intercept or to get you to break down or to fall apart or to crumble so that you will not have what it takes to reach the other side. And unfortunately, many believers go their whole life existing but never making it to the other side. Churching but not making it to the other side. Shouting and jumping, nothing wrong we shout and we jump, but literally I'm going to shout because I made it to the other side. I'm going to shout because I'm in the same place I was 10 years ago. I'm, I'm gonna, I got some stuff God promised me. I got a prophecy over my head. I have a word that God has sent over my household and we got to get to the other side. I'm not content with just coming to church in a religious spectrum of just doing life. But I'm not placing the principles so the Bible says the word is released, verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And all the boats were also with him. Verse 37, watch this. And a great windstorm arose. The word arose is applied to us. At first, this was my thing. When Jesus announced, we're going to the other side, it, it was sun. It was good. A, a good temperature. The weather was perfect. Life was going fine, but soon Jesus announced, because of us, all of a sudden, this arose. This appeared out of nowhere. Because understanding how spiritual warfare works, it comes and it catches you off. It comes out of nowhere. It comes unexpected. It comes at a time when you say, this doesn't make sense. It comes to throw you off God. This great storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. Which means there was great tension and pressure that pushed up against them. This represents resistance. Because the greatest design of spiritual warfare, which is also another word for satanic engineered storm, spiritual warfare is designed to bring great resistance, to restrict progression in a current direction. It's designed to resist you from getting to a Yeah. 
some of you are under mm. satanic engineer wow. stories. And you know what's dangerous about this? <laughs> because in other storms, some of us, this is the beauty of God's grace, you never pray. You just wait it out. God's allowed you to overcome so this, this, this level of storm is not like the other storms. Yeah. Not doing anything is placing you in a position to lose everything. Wow. One more time. Not doing anything, just, I'm going to just wait it out. Whoa. Not doing anything is going to position you to lose everything. Mm. I have to do something. Signs that you are warfare. Signs that you are in a satanic engineer storm. Unusual fatigue. Wow. One of the first signs how you know you're in, you're in warfare. Unusual fatigue. Wow. I'm not talking about your, your, you, know, you stayed up uh, on TikTok to four Press! 
are so mighty that we know we're not. Yeah. Mm. Correction can save your life. Yes. Offense. Come in relationship. This is right here. Come in relationship being on the attack. Yes, the enemy will attack you. will have friction in your man. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, everything will go down. You and your wife will get along good. Laughing in the house and oh, and singing love songs. Because will your emotions feel the impact 
Christ on course. I'm not saying that you don't feel certain things. You're human. I understand. But when you are so worn down and so pulled mm -hmm. to emotionally give or invest into this storm, so much of emotional dysfunction with fear, mm. with your confession, yeah. with your mental clarity, everything is so this aside. And you only see it one side. There's no hope. You only see the worst. You only expect the worst. It shows that your emotions are so invested into it that you have no level of faith to put the level of fight spiritually that it takes to come out of it. So Jesus was implying Jesus was sleep. It's like, what Jesus? Because he had no emotional investment into it. Two of you 
shall agree that deals with covenant. That's covenant deals with agreement. On earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. This is what I want you to see. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I said it. Two of them, which deals with covenant, shall agree. Agreement is the prerequisite. You have to have agreement in order to have covenant. This is how you win and set tag into this home. I would say the power. I said this before, but I mentioned it again. I did a 30 day fast. I did it with myself. I, I did it with a covenant brother. And I knew, I've done 21 days with no food. But I knew I would never be able to do 30 days with no food unless I did it with someone who was strong. Yeah. And so, partnering with this covenant brother of mine, I was able to do 30 days with no food to fast and pray. I saw so many breakthroughs, and still see breakthroughs from that fast. And so, just imagine the progression you can the spiritual realm when you partner with someone that you go in covenant with to continue the spiritual realm. One of, one of our spirit daughters were in an intense battle, witchcraft attack. We saw how major it was. We could have pulled her out, put her set up for a bunch for the rest of her life. And prophetess got a strategy from heaven that dealt with covenant prayer. We have the two intercessors in the church, along with herself, interceding and praying. And 21 days of consecutive prayer at the same time, every night we saw the hand of heaven, the hand of God move and help to break the power of this satanic engineer storm, this warfare, this demonic attack that broke her out of it and freed her. Yeah. But it took covenant prayer 21 days consecutively at the same time. We want to do two days.
Samuel 11, 14, said, and, and the next morning, they wrote a letter to Joab, gave to Uriah. How did he got Uriah to kill? He tried to mind down and convince him and deceive him. And Uriah just was, I'm, I'm going to be so loyal to you, David. It's crazy how Uriah was so loyal to David, but David was not loyal to him. <laughs> That's a whole other message for a whole other day. In verse 15, the letter struck to Joab. Look what David told one of his commanders in the army. Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. The front lines, you have to be equipped to do. Every soldier was not equipped to deal with what came with the front lines of the battle. This is why placement in ministry is key. And so when I move you to another area in ministry, it's not time for you to be in your feelings. I'm understanding that there's a battle going on that's fierce and you're not capable of fighting it. You don't have the capacity emotionally to fight it. So let me move you to another place. So what got your mind in trouble is David placed him in a position that he wasn't prepared for. He wasn't equipped for. And when the battle got the fiercest, the Bible says, mm. right in the text, the pull back, he was killed. He was killed. So Joel assigned the right to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. So where's your line of defense? Mm. You know, there's different levels of self-engineered storm. Just like in the natural, F1 terminal, F2, F3, F4, F5. Oh. F1, you maybe can handle that storm by yourself, right? Yeah. By yourself yeah. interceding. Yeah. But some of the self, I mean, the satanic engineer storm, depending on what level it is, if it's an L3, if it's an L4, oh. you're going to need cover to fight. Mm -hmm. You ain't going to be able to win that by yourself. Mm -hmm. This is why it's stupid to be in division as a church. And yeah. offense yeah. is a church. Why? Because we need each other to win these battles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Satan, how he, how he dominates, I keep the people in division and strife and a hidden offenses because I understand if they're divided, they can't conquer. Thus, that marriage is divided. They can't conquer. So certain levels of storms, the greater the destiny, the greater the storm. This church has a great destiny ahead of us. There's another side. We ain't even scraped the surface to what God has called this house to accomplish, to what we call this house to do. We ain't scraped the surface. We look back on that year like, man, we've done a lot in the city, we've done a lot, a lot of souls saved. We ain't even scraped the surface. This is why we cannot fall to the wickedness of saved devices, which to keep us divided, to keep us offended. To keep us looking at each other as we're the problem, not your problem. The demons are your problem. The devil is your problem. I'm not your problem. Look at someone beside you. I'm saying I'm not your problem. I'm not your problem. I'm not your battle. You ain't fighting me. You got the wrong battle. I'm your sister. I'm your brother. I'm your leader. We need each other. When churches are in covenant together, praying in a one accord. Able to take an entire world. They turn the they put back, they turn the world upside down. So much power and deliverance. And the gospel of Jesus went throughout the world. They were turning countries upside down. They didn't know what to do. They were trying to lock them up. They were breaking out of prison in the middle of the night. Angels were breaking them out of prison. They were seeing sickness here like that. They were seeing financial miracles come to pass. There was so much taking place in that era with these groups of apostles who were on fire for Jesus, who was in one place on one accord in covenant prayer. They went to the temple daily to pray the covenant, and they were able to turn the world upside down. Oh, I believe there's a church that can turn Mississippi upside down. If we come together in covenant prayer, 